A whale is perhaps a thousand times larger than a human is. So why do they not all die of cancer? Cancers form when cells mutate. So if you have a thousand times more cells, ought you not have a thousand times more cancers? The question of why whales don't appear to have vastly more cancers than, say, humans, this is called Peto's paradox. And perhaps untangling this paradox might give us humans some insight in how to treat human cancers. Let's try to understand what might be happening. Suppose you have a long strand of DNA like this one. Well, DNA is often broken into genes, which are strands of the DNA, maybe something like a thousand base pairs long. Now, what we're going to try to study in this video is the mutation rate within critical genes, genes that are known to be influential in something like colorectal cancer. And basically what I want to imagine here is that I begin with a bunch of different cells. And as they divide, those divisions might introduce mutations. So in this case, it divided once, and it introduced critical mutations in two different cells. Now, two critical mutations in seven cells would be incredibly unlikely. The mutation rate is far smaller than that in reality. But for the purpose of our illustration, let's imagine we've got these two red ones. Well, now my cell divides again, and maybe I introduce a, a new mutation in one of the other cells. I mutate again, and what I'm indicating here with the fact that I've got two red mutations occurring in the same cell, that second cell, is just that there's been two different mutations in two different locations. And then I may as well keep on dividing, and as I go through, I get more and more mutations in different cells. And in this problematic second cell, we've already accumulated five different critical mutations in the animation that I've given. Now, the real goal of this video is to try and use a bit of mathematics. This is a math channel after all, some very simple probability calculations to just get a rough handle on like the probabilities of forming cancer and what kind of parameters might influence how likely that's going to be in different species with different body masses. The specific numbers that we're going to talk about in this video are going to come from an analysis of colorectal cancers. But the general idea is to see whether our mathematics can just give us a little bit of insight about some of the key factors. So we're going to begin by introducing a parameter mu, which just refers to the mutation rate. It's the, the probability that a mutation is formed in some specific critical gene in a particular division. And these numbers are very, very small, something like 10 to the minus 6. It's a tiny number. But there's a lot of cells, and there's a lot of divisions. So even if the individual rate for a specific gene in a specific division is small, when you consider the number of divisions over the lifetime of a whale or a human, which maybe both live similar orders of magnitude, these can get up really big to the point that cancers actually form. So the mu I can visualize in the, in the way I've done before. I've got a specific cell, and the question is, is there going to be a mutation in a critical gene of that specific cell? Now, what I want to compute is over multiple divisions, what's the probability that you get a critical mutation? It's a little bit challenging to go to that problem directly, because sometimes you might have a one mutation, sometimes two, three, or many. Maybe very rarely you even have a mutation that mutates back. There's a lot of complexity. It's much easier to study the probability that no mutation occurs. Uh, let me illustrate this probability concept just with coins very briefly before we go into the main formula. The idea if I flip two coins, and let me try and study the chance that you flip head. So flipping head is sort of analogous to getting a mutation here. Well, both coins might be heads, the left one might be a head, the right one might be a head. It's complicated. There's multiple options. But what I could instead do is take the probability that there's at least one head and say that it is one minus the probability that it's all tails. If I take the probability where it's all tails, which is just a single possible outcome here, then one minus that gives all the possible ways that you could have at least one head. In our case, the probability of two tails, well, 50% chance of a tail, so 50% squared. Final computation, one minus that is three quarters. So let's use that trick. I'm going to say that the probability that I am going to have a mutation formed after d division, so I've divided d times, is going to be, I'm going to leverage that 1 minus trick. If I look at 1 minus mu, that is the probability that there is 
no mutation formed after one round. And so the probability that there's no mutations after d rounds is 1 minus mu to the power of d. And then if I really want to keep track of the probability that there is a mutation, it's 1 minus that. So the final formula is 1 minus 1 minus mu to the power of d. But it turns out that most of the time when cancers form, it's not just a single mutation that is needed. This depends on the specific cancer and the epidemiology of that specific cancer. But typically, you need multiple different mutations, perhaps in different critical genes, all working together in order to get the cancer. I gave the illustration previously, for example, of this cell that's got multiple critical mutations occurring as it's gone and divided. So what we can use as a proxy for this, and it depends on the specific cancer, is a value of k, that you need k mutations in order for the cancer to be formed. Common numbers for this might be something like k is 5 or 6. Now, the probability for that is I just take the previous thing and raise it to the power of k. The probability that there's k mutations, it has to happen the first time, the second time, the third time, all the way to the kth time. That low probability is multiplied k times. So you take the 1 minus 1 minus mu to the d that you had before and raise all of that to the power of k. Since these are small numbers, raising to the power of k has made it even less likely. But now we get to deal with the fact there's a massive number of cells. So what should we do if there is n different cells? Because a cancer only needs to form in one of them to start spreading. It doesn't matter whether it forms in multiple ones. And since we're doing the same kind of probability that there is at least one cell that has these k mutations, we're going to do the 1 minus trick. So what do we get? Well, on the inside, we take the probability of not having k mutations in any of the cells. And what you do is there's probability of not having the mutation in one of the cells and raise that to the power of the number of cells. And then if you want the probability that there is a mutation in one of these n cells, you take 1 minus it. So we get our final formula here. And this creates an algebraic model of the probability of getting cancer. And if you look at this messy formula of the 1 minus 1 minus all of that, it's basically just a probability counting argument. It's separating it out into the mutation rate mu, the number of divisions d, the, the number of critical mutations you need in a cancer k, and the total number of stem cells. Okay, well let's work this out in a specific example. If you set mu to be 10 to the minus 6, k equal to 5, I've done a number of divisions which basically says there's a division once every four days. So there, if, a, if an animal lives for 90 years, which some whales do and some humans do, then 90 years times 365 days per year and then one uh, division every four days gives a number around 8,000. And then finally, we'll say there's 600 million cells. This number of cells was specifically looking for humans at the number of stem cells in the colon. So plug in the formula and you get a value of about 2%, which is actually pretty good. Uh, the numbers of colorectal cancers were reported by the American Cancer Society is a number maybe like 5.3% chance of getting it at some point in your lifetime. This general model and these specific numbers come from this paper from Calabrese and Shivada. I've put the link down in the description. And I just want to be clear that this is a mathematical model, and a pretty simple one. It's, it's one that hides a lot of the biological complexities in it. As mathematicians, we're trying to provide some insight into sort of the orders of magnitudes of things. We're, we're not trying to understand, as mathematicians, the precise biological processes. That is left to the biologist. But what we can do here is explore what happens as we fiddle around with these numbers. For example, let's imagine that we change the value of n. Let's add three zeros to that value of n here. That is, I'm going up three orders of magnitudes between humans and whales, but I'm presuming that everything else was to stay the same. The same mutation rate, the same number of divisions, the same number of critical mutations that were needed to form a cancer k. Well, you do that, you basically get more or less 100%. And this is why I said it's a, it's a bit of a paradox. If all you're changing is the n, then you should be the case that basically every whale is going to get colorectal cancer in their lifetime, which is, which is not really what we observe, although we don't have great data on what the true rate actually is. 
For example, suppose I manipulated the mutation rate from 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 7. But then only a 10 times difference in the mutation rate, despite a thousand times difference in the number of cells, gives, well, basically the same probability as for humans. And in fact, in a paper by Colin et al, I'll put the link down to the description for that as well, they slightly tweak the analysis and are able to show that for actually only a 3.2 times decrease in the mutation rate, you can match up and have the same probability as in humans. Alternatively, if you went from k equal to 6 to k equal to 8, that would also do the trick, as would adding in the probability that you get something called tumor suppressing genes. There's many different ways that you can play around with it and eventually try and resolve Pito's paradox. Now, we don't know the exact resolution to Pito's paradox, but as a mathematician, as a math modeler, I really enjoy problems like this where we can put some constraints, some bounds on the relationship between factors with very simple and easy to understand models like this one. Now, I normally only focus on the math on this channel, so I hope that you enjoyed my little exploration into biology, but you know what? Hey, this year is actually my 10 year anniversary since cancer myself, so I was just really excited about this video. Now, as an educator, I know that to really master and understand a lot of different subjects, it takes more than just watching videos on YouTube as much as I love doing that. And that is why I strongly recommend the sponsor for today's video, which is Brilliant.org. Brilliant has thousands of lessons in science, math, computer science. What I really appreciate about them is just how interactive they are. You get to play with the animation. You get to try out the activities that help you assess your understanding. And if you get stuck, Brilliant helps you figure it out. Brilliant designs their lessons to break down the big ideas into digestible chunks, building up complexity in layers so that you are understanding every step along the way. As a professor, I know this kind of student-centered, active learning is really effective, and that's why I'm so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett, the link is down in the description, to check out everything that they have for free for a full 30 days, or the first 200 of you to click that link will get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said and done, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below, and we'll do some more math in the next video.